37 people so far, so that's great. Yes, I think we can get started now. Hopefully everybody's audio issues are resolved. So welcome to the e-impact workshop by the IAE. So looking at the environmental impacts of the internet. And uh, we're going to get started with some ground rules. So we will record the session. Cindy, can you confirm that the recording is on? Um, we are being recorded, yes. Yes, good. And uh, the recordings will actually be published uh, in YouTube later. Um, your position papers, for those that submitted the position paper, you, you, they have been made public on the workshop webpage. And um, this is, of course, a professional meeting, so we expect everybody to uh, behave in a professional manner. Any kind of harassment is not tolerated. And uh, I do want to say that this is like if you used to ITF meetings, then this is maybe a little bit more diverse group of people. So not everybody has the same background. And it's useful to remember when we are discussing. So please be polite, obviously, but also explain your viewpoint in an understandable manner. And uh, let's all learn from each other's viewpoint. So that's the reason we actually are here. And uh, today's agenda, this is the welcome session. We're cover, going to cover some practicalities, uh, why we are here. We can talk about uh, some big picture issues, um, interaction elsewhere, how this relates to societal issues and so forth. You can see the agenda on screen, I hope. And um, I'm gonna start with, uh, well, doing this and also some of the big picture um, issues. And then we'll have Torres, Eve and Vesna. And um, it's the same pattern for all of these sessions. We actually have four sessions, so this is the first of the four. Um, so we will have, not everybody is presenting like their position paper, um, most people aren't. But uh, we will have some uh, hopefully exciting presentations at the beginning to get us started and then we can discuss. And the discussion is actually the, maybe the main goal. Perhaps we can get to some conclusions even in some some cases or at least identify some issues. Any agenda comments so far? Moving on. So the upcoming sessions uh, this week, Thursday and Friday, there's uh, two sessions. One is on what we understand about the situation. So that's about things like how much is the internet actually using, for instance, energy or producing carbon. Um, but also other other things, and what what do we don't understand? Can we do the whole breakdown of where is the where is the impact and what is causing it and and why and so on? And I don't actually think that we understand everything, so clearly there's, there's room for discussion. And then on the Friday session, we'll talk about improvements of uh, different categories. Uh, we'll have some uh, talks on specific areas of technology to get us started, and there's a discussion. And then on the Next Monday, exactly a week from now, all the sessions are, by the way, at the same time. We will talk about uh, what the conclusions might be. So, reporting back or reflecting back a little bit from the earlier sessions and look at specific areas. Um, where are we on that and what should be done next? And then some discussion and talking about how we go about reporting and so forth. I, by the way, apologize that it's been difficult to. Um, uh, has scheduled these sessions. Uh, it, it, there was a collision with some other ITF activities, among others. Um, it's a big group, though, so it was um, somewhat challenging when we went by the uh, Doodle poll results. And uh, it could have perhaps improved this by being more aware of what's going on elsewhere in the ITF. But uh, yeah, maybe maybe in the end we do have a reasonable number of people now quite many actually joined this one. So that's great, thank you. And it's also not, not the greatest time for some parts of the world. So apologies for that as well. Um, brief talk about the rationale. I think we all understand, so no, no need to go into the details of this, but uh, obviously uh, saving the planet is, is one of the biggest things that we, we could be uh, worried about or working towards for. Um, and, you know, it, it, it just, it, it's hugely important, of course. And um, the one thing that I would like to highlight is also that, that it's not just, we're not just doing this for the good of the humankind and good of the planet, but this is also very much the 
uh, reality in business world, many of the private enterprises have very hard requirements on how much energy, for instance, they can use and what type. So um, there's a lot of reasons, like everything is pointing to the same direction that we have to worry about this and make sure that we do our best. And of course, the internet is an incredibly powerful tool and we can both help uh, the societies and also damage them. So it can help, for instance, by, as an example, um, you know, organizing meetings that where people don't have to travel on airplanes all over the place to, to have a discussion like, like this one is. But it can also amplify harmful issues. So with the click of a button, you can, you can uh, order physical goods on your doorstep. And you know, maybe that's not always great. Um, and of course, the internet uh, itself uses energy or the whole system. We're thinking about this in an end-to-end -end fashion consumes energy, consumes raw materials, and, um, you know, leaves some pollution. And the question is then, can we do something about it? And basically, we are researchers or technologists or um, networking people. Um, can we improve somehow in terms of the costs of the internet or provide better benefits from the internet to the rest of the society? Or at least could we promote research that we think is needed in order to make improvements later or um, just understand things better. Um, practicalities, um, of course, the goal is to learn from each other. So let's um, read and listen and comment. And this is not a bunch of talking heads, I hope, um, but it's actual discussion. So please comment uh, whenever it's uh, when, when you have a, uh, something to, just to say. And we have this convention that uh, will form a queue on, on the, because there's quite many people. So maybe it's useful to, to have a queue so that not everybody is talking at the same time. So if you on the chat line say plus Q, then you enter the queue and say minus Q, then you exit the queue. I'll try and track that list of people and call up uh, when it's your time to speak. We do have a bit of a, like a, you know, set of, short presentations at the beginning always. So you may consider if you're, you wanna um, have your question in the middle of, of the presentation, that's also totally fine. Or you wanna save a big, maybe a bigger topic for, for the discussion part. So it's sort of up to you. Uh, everybody should contribute. This is not uh, the IAB or anybody um, in the program committee or, or anyone to um, dictate what the result is. Uh, it's all up to us. So whatever comes out of this, whatever conclusions, it's really up to each and every one of us. So please contribute. Um, I did mention already that the position papers and recordings will be published. Uh, we'll also produce a report uh, as is traditionally done from this IAB workshops. Um, so that would typically contain things like, you know, record of the discussions, but also things like recommendations or observations. And um, these are hopefully permanent things. So they will uh, go into an RFC, obviously, and everything, all the materials will be stored in the IAP web page for, for this workshop. So that's the, that's basically the setup. Um, there's any questions on, on or comments on, on this um, organizational part, then this would be a good time to ask. Are, are we only discussing the impact the internet have on, negative impact um, internet have on society, or are we also discussing how the internet can help reducing the carbon footprint in other industries like like reducing travel both or that's at least the scope and then we'll actually get to that in, in in one minute but but it depends a little bit on what people are sort of more most interested in it it's not that the scope restricts you but you might be if you're a protocol engineer you might be more, more interested in protocol details which is more about the costs than, than helping, helping other, other parts of the society. Any other questions? Shall we move forward? Okay. Um, 
So then I'm going to move to the second presentation, which is about um, the big picture. Um, so this is a little bit uh, about what John, you were asking about. So what's the scope? Uh, what are the issues? What are the relationships? What well, is this only about technology or, or costs? And um, I, I don't know if this is sort of a useful thing. Um, I think it illustrates nicely what uh, how broad this topic is. And so this isn't like an official categorization of everything related to improving energy efficiency or environmental impacts um, in the whole world or or even in um, ICT or, or, or the internet. But it, it's a uh, simply a drawing of your, what your position papers fell on like different categories and um, it's obviously a snapshot of a particular community that's interested in particular things so for instance you see that the protocol aspects are fairly highly um, uh, focused on here um, so there's quite a lot of uh, contributions on that angle but there's also another big uh, item around this understanding and measurements and um, yeah, sort of perhaps from a slightly more academic perspective that we want to understand what's going on, how much, uh, you know, this or that is consumed or how much uh, impact do we cause in terms of raw materials or or other other types of things. Um, so that's also important, but there's also tons of other things. There's, some people have looked at implementation aspects. Some people have looked at uh, user behavior. There's the soci uh, societal issues. There's benefits to other fields. There's even discussion of some of the, or in, in some papers, there was some discussion of the actors who, who should do what and who are involved and so on. So it's, it's pretty broad. So the, the main, main point that I'm trying to make here is that this is, this is um, bigger than our individual and also, if I'm I'm used to doing a particular thing, let's say I'm I'm working with clean energy, then you know I'm obviously very interested in making sure that everybody transits to uh, uh, or switches to use of clean energy. But that's obviously not the only thing that needs to be done. There's multiple aspects, and maybe that's the thing that I want you to remember. So. Um, we're trying to take an end-to-end -end view across devices, networks, data centers, and applications. This is not just a big eye internet and you know just the transmission of packets in the routers, but but it's the whole thing. Um, we should remember that impacts can come from use, of course, but also manufacturing and decommissioning. What kind of uh, e-waste remains? Um, we should worry about greenhouse gases, obviously, um, but also other issues might might be quite relevant. Uh, we should consider both first and second order impacts. So, um, you know, first order impact is is, is that we, uh, for instance, produce some pollution or CO2 from running our systems. But then there's the second order that, like, well, we can, for instance, help the, the society to do something in a more efficient manner, avoid flying, for instance, or, or some such. Um, of course, those impacts can be both positive and negative, so we have to remember that. Uh, improvements are obviously interesting for this workshop, but not only that, it's not just about fixing stuff, it's about also about understanding stuff. So if we at least understand that here is an issue, then, then that's, you know, we're one step further. Um, and it's also important to understand the trade-offs and costs of you know, whatever we would change. That's uh, Alvaro and others um, commented that on, on their position paper, which I recommend reading. And we can't ignore the social business and other non-technical aspects and, or, or even regulation of governments. So those are all sort of linked. Um, Solutions, they can come from many, many different uh, angles. It can be about implementations, protocols, and standards, which are, you know, for many of us, it's the main thing. Uh, it can also be about clean energy. It can be changes in business practices. You know, imagine, for instance, if you didn't have advertisement-based business models, would that impact somehow? I, I don't know, because I don't think we have measurements, but it, it's an interesting question. Um, we could have better awareness, better measurements, and better transparency in the networks that, hey, this is this is what's happening because of your request. Or we could simply be building better tools for somebody else to do 
video conferencing, for instance. Um, so that's it from my side. If there's um, any um, quick comments on this, we can take that. Otherwise, we can proceed to Twirless. And Twirless, are you online and are you able to share? Yep, thank you. Okay, small fight with the unmute button. A classic. All right, can you see the slides? Hello? Yes. Okay. Yep. Cool. All right, so. Let's uh, look into the review mirror. So this is a position paper on um, what we have done um, around energy uh, in the IETF. Um, and uh, this info slide shows uh, who's been working on that and uh, where you can find and discuss it as well. So why did we start this work now? So last year, um, IP, RFC 7091, turned 40 years old and we didn't have a party. Of course, there was COVID. So maybe time for an early midlife crisis. Um, so there is a lot of positive things, obviously, we're aware of what our technology has done, right? And that I think that became particularly obvious in, um, in during Corona uh, when nobody could physically move. Um, and uh, it was really the internet uh, and other TCP IP networks that uh, enabled, uh, you know, for society to really continue to, to operate much better than it would have been possible 30 years ago or, well, 1918, I think it was. Um, so, but on the other hand, uh, I think we're also aware of a lot of the counterpoints of the overall energy consumption and its impact in the IT uh, industry. And then, of course, also a lot of societal, cultural, and political impacts of the internet itself. Um, so, before looking forward, it seemed good to start analyzing what we have done. Um, and uh, the hope, of course, is that it enables more contributors for future work to um, understand where we are, what we have done, um, find uh, in that work uh, gaps. But of course, as uh, people with cool uh, slogans have told us for hundreds of years, um, just because we know what the past is doesn't mean that uh, you know it. Uh, we know exactly what to do next. Um, so what's the scope and how do we go go along, right? So um, especially amongst my colleagues, um, some of them like Hesham or so, we're doing a great job in collecting a lot of cool information about the whole energy uh, consumption in the IT uh, industry operations lifecycle, the cost of the network infrastructure versus the client data center mobile use cases. So it's, it's really overwhelming if you think about the impact of energy in IT and society uh, around IT. Um, so, of course, it became a lot easier when um, looking at this document by simply saying, well, we'll have to somehow prove what the IETF had to do with it by relating it to um, the work that the IETF has done, which is finished RFCs or also attempted and uh, as of yet abandoned drafts, um, and then basically try to um, structure um, the work around that. That makes the document a little bit uh, hard to read uh, with all the references in it, but obviously for people, you know, that we're targeting like the ones uh, hopefully doing new work with it, I think that's uh, the best that we can do. And it turns out that most um, of the impact that uh, our work has done um, is, is really incidental, right? Because energy often uh, became a relevant metric of considerations much later uh, than the work itself. Um, and intentional energy related work only recently happened in the last maybe 20 years. Right. And um, one of the other points was, uh, you know, to recognize that we need to expand from energy to sustainability by using carbon based metrics uh, whenever um, the, the use case and workflows um, of the technology are uh, really allowed to take that into consideration, um, because that pretty much means that the same energy consumption is less problematic uh, if it can use renewable energy than if it would have to use, you know, carbon burning energy. All right, so here is just a single page overview of uh, what the document uh, entails. It's 40 pages, so um, you know, I hope uh, many of you will have read it or will read it after this, uh, um, these slides. Um, it starts with really the um, 
high level tenets of the internet and other TCP IP networks of the, its architecture, its networks, right? And that is in general energy saving through scale, right? And there are a lot of technologies that uh, produce scale through convergence, um, through um, global networking, through federation, you know, the internet itself is the biggest uh, federated network. There is uh, encryption and freedom to innovate, right? All these things brought more applications, more users, more workflows into the same networks, allowed them to scale, reduce cost, and therefore make the solutions even more competitive and attractive um, uh, than, you know, their prior um, alternatives if they then existed. And I'm going into um, especially details of um, applications we are mostly aware of, like the telecollaboration, where we've seen, you know, a 40 year history from email through telephony like SIP and then uh, lately RTC web, which is at the core of all the video conferencing that, you know, has, <laughs> I'd say, uh, saved the planet's communications during Corona times, right? But of course, the more uh, uh, broader topic of digitization, replacement of workflows without IT with those uh, that use the internet or other TCP IP networks is uh, also captured there. Um, then exactly that expansion from um, energy saving as um, the, the core benefit to, to enabling the use of sustainable energy um, and computation with that, for example. So uh, I, I give some examples of how um, the internet and ITF technologies um, uh, benefit there and then ultimately we get into the area where um, energy was exactly one of the core um, targets of improving um, the IETF uh, protocol landscape and that is what we call the low power and lossy constrained networks and we have a humongous set of uh, working groups that have been working on that and it all comes from devices with very little ability to um, have energy whether it's battery based or self-production of the energy um, so there is um, um, really a good uh, great amount of work which I think will also proliferate um, into faster uh, and uh, more energy available networks in the future just because they're all more efficient than their prior counterparts. Um, then finally, um, a lot of technology details with sample technologies that save energy, sleepy nodes, multicast, um, discussions around uh, the use of TCP IP technologies in the energy networks themselves, the smart grid, the synchrophaser networks, uh, which enable really to avoid brownouts uh, on the planet uh, much better uh, than in the past. Uh, working groups for measurements that we had, EMEN um, and uh, metrics and benchmarking, and then the power awareness of these metrics, um, which you know hasn't uh, gone very far. Uh, today via the PANET effort and um, uh, ultimately, of course, what's happening today is through SDN mechanisms. So that's kind of the, the rundown. Um, I, I haven't counted. I, I think it's in excess of 100 references to, to, to RFCs and drafts that are in the document. So um, there is a humongous amount of work that we've done, uh, at least when you start uh, thinking about how the energy related impact of IETF work um, specific documents is not only the networks that were produced with them. All right, so um, reviewers asked me, okay, so rear view mirror is nice, but uh, what really is next? And I was trying to figure out here three points, right? Um, so first of all, I think there is significant, but not easy optimization and enhancement at the network layer. Um, I think there are a lot more, you know, uh, workflows as we've seen with RTC web latest uh, and others that I think uh, if we're engaged in these uh, workflows using the network, um, they, they can become better. Um, but ultimately, when we look at the inflection points, the, the really big changes in, in our history of uh, the Internet, I think we have the Internet itself, mobility data centers as maybe the top three. And I think the next and already starting uh, big inflection point is renewable energy because it will break barriers for energy consumptions maybe only decades out. But we're really seeing this starting in pockets. Um, I think it's going to go through all uh, forms of energy consumption. Um, and uh, many of those will need IT components for that. Um, and uh, I've, I've been giving a few uh, examples like the time and place shift. Um, but ultimately, when there is a surplus of energy, what are the next cool, you know, IT internet based um, uh, use cases, workflows that those would enable? All right. And that's it. Thank you.
Thanks. And uh, we do have time for short questions if there are any. Otherwise, um, we can let Eve continue. Okay, I don't see any questions in the chat at least. So moving forward, Eve, can you share? Sure. Chris, were you coming on video to ask a question? You're good. Okay. Let me share my screen. Are you seeing that? Uh, we see your screen, yes. Thank you. Let's see. I'm trying to get this to go away. Okay. There's a lot of, so you're probably seeing the pop ups as well. It's very odd. No, we're not seeing the pop ups. That's, that's good, Eve. Okay. Let me, are you seeing? Uh, Full screen. I'm a little confused here, but um, there, I have a lot of stuff popped up on my screen. So are you seeing the, the notes or are you seeing the main screen? Just the, just the slides, just the slides, Slide. full screen. Oh, that's excellent. You're on first, first slide and nothing else is visible. Okay, so it's kind of reversed my screen, so that's why I'm a little bit confused. Okay, but anyway, uh, suffice to say, I'm Eve Schuler. I'm from Intel and I'm, um, I have done this work uh, with um, my colleagues from uh, Oxford and Ori and Yale and Intel, and uh, we co-authored the position paper, a perspective on carbon aware networking. And uh, the request for this lightning talk, however, was really to focus on carbon versus energy. And that's really because um, if you look at sustainability research, Within uh, ICT community, the information communication technology community or sector, it's traditionally focused on energy efficiency and the goal to consume less energy. However, there's this complementary goal, uh, which is really to decarbonize the energy consumed. So if you're going to consume energy, ensure that it's green, it's generated by renewables um, or other clean energy technologies. Um, and then really we're, we consider that there's this third pillar for sustainable ICT, which is to minimize um, other environmental impacts. Um, and today, and for most of this workshop, I think we were largely here about energy and decarbonization. Um, the effective, the most effective action, of course, is um, at the intersection of this Venn diagram and more typically, or I would say paradoxically, uh, it's often the case that one pillar is achieved, but not necessarily the others. So, for for example, um, zero emissions does not necessarily equal energy efficient. Case in point being some of what's going on with renewably powered Bitcoin mining and cryptocurrency data centers. Um, nor does energy efficiency equal zero emissions. Um, a high energy efficiency a uh, factory may be located in a geography where the power is generated from fossil fuel and therefore has carbon, high carbon intensity. Um, and so uh, it really, again, I'm struggling a little bit with my screens here, but um, so uh, to really reduce the growing electricity usage of um, the ICT sector and in turn the carbon footprint of data centers. Some of the hyperscalers um, have developed and deployed what they are calling either carbon intelligent or carbon aware computing. And that's really focusing on maximizing the usage of renewable and clean energy. And uh, they time shift their compute orchestrated workloads to align with when electricity has the lowest carbon intensity and is the cleanest. And this is a really nice symbiotic relationship in that renewables help data centers and ICT in general to lower their carbon footprints. And ICT in turn helps stabilize the grid by maximizing the usage of renewable energy and consuming as Torlis uh, referred to excess energy that would otherwise go unused. Um, and in these geographies like California and Germany, where renewables integration and energy generation from new renewable, renewables is outpacing consumption, um, uh, that's a really important stabilizing aspect for the grid. So this carbon awareness allows data centers to load balance the grid or to serve as virtual batteries. 
um, and our paper refers to some of the references for that. Um, but it more importantly leads us to ask, uh, why not employ carbon awareness everywhere and throughout the entire ecosystem, uh, ICT ecosystem, and not just in hyper da hyperscaler data centers, but throughout the edge to cloud continuum, um, throughout uh, as we begin to roll out next generation infrastructure, um, particularly in places where it's possible to more approximately co-locate with renewables. Uh, let's not just focus on carbon aware compute, but other facets of systems like storage and networking uh, and begin to adopt carbon intens intensity as a, one of these quality of service metrics. And um, we, of course, want to look at not just what can we do with hardware, but all the way uh, through software components vertically up and down the stack um, and in in what software that's resident in a particular platform, but also end to end horizontally. And we are going to need a lot of entry points in the architecture for APIs that allow us to uh, gain some insights from carbon awareness. I've included a couple graphs on the right, and uh, they're blown up in the background of my slide, so you can peruse the details. But here, the main point was that um, the graph on the top emphasizes pictorially sort of the growth, and we can argue about how much growth is going to happen, but we do uh, believe that growth is going to continue. Um, the, the orange uh, in that is the data center growth, but you can see there's a lot that lies outside of the data centers. And uh, when you study the details, you can see that networking is definitely on par with um, data centers in terms of its carbon footprint. Um, so there's some self-reflection we should be doing. Uh, but the, the bottom graph is uh, actually from uh, California's um, uh, uh, estimation of its, not estimation, it's the measurement of its, how much curtailment it has to do because it had excess renewable energy. Um, and you can see the variability and growth of that as well. Um, and so it leads us naturally to uh, what might carbon aware networking look like from an IP, ITF perspective. So uh, again, because this is a lightning talk, I'm going to sort of quickly go through this. Uh, for carbon aware routing, we really like our current routing protocols to be able to select, would, we'd like them to evolve to be able to select more carbon efficient paths possibly by considering carbon intensity as an additional QoS metric, but also by acknowledging that we have time variant links, some that might be powered by renewable energy and thus might predictably come, be coming and going, um, inspired by some of the delay tolerant network uh, activity in the ITF there's, and, and the intermittency of green energy. We'd also like to construct some carbon aware transports to schedule the time and space shifting of data transmissions, not just orchestrated workloads, um, and to minimize the carbon cost for use cases that are time elastic naturally, such as bulk data transfers for backups, for software updates, for delay, uh, telemetry data collection, and so forth. Inspired, I think, by uh, some of the work going on in uh, the DetNet or deterministic networking community, uh, carbon aware traffic engineering could be called upon to guarantee that flows stay within carbon consumption budgets, possibly employing hop by hop techniques and uh, possibly also reserving clean energy resources along the way. And of course, foundational to everything is that carbon telemetry uh, needs to exist for all this work and it requires network element observability. Uh, but also an awareness and reduction of its own impact. And um, again, due to time here, we'll, we'll queue up, you know, what the challenges are here for discussion in uh, session four, we're going to have another lightning talk um, to talk about the, the next steps for carbon aware um, networking. Um, but suffice to say here that some of the challenges are really to uh, make real-time um, tracking and reporting for electricity consumption something that's uh, accessible. Uh, additionally, tracking and reporting for finer grain electricity carbon intensity. Um, and those things together map to uh, the, the network paths that we use because ultimately if we want to understand 
the carbon efficiency or the uh, environmental impact of applications and services. We need to understand the networking paths that they're all using, especially as they become more distributed in time, which they have. Uh, and and um, obviously, uh, once you have all that information, what is it that we're going to actually do with it? How are we going to react in near time, near real time to carbon related information? Uh, uh, this is just to point you at a couple other readings if you want to look at further details, but then there's some terrific um, papers throughout the workshop um, having to do with uh, carbon in general, uh, whether that's uh, Bruce Nordman's paper on pricing um, of uh, what's going on, you know, behind the scenes, the sort of business elements. There's um, additional, there, uh, there's another paper on carbon aware networking. Um, that Chris Adams uh, and, and his co-authors wrote, as well as uh, interesting papers on metrics that clearly pertain to this, as well as, you know, power proportionality and how that affects um, energy tracking and, in turn, uh, the carbon impact um, as things are both static and variable. So there you have it. That was my, um, my talk. I don't know how to stop sharing. <laughs> So maybe let's see. Oh, I think here. Yeah, maybe you go to the top of your screen and then stop. Yeah, there um, you go. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, good. Um, thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, I, I think I will at least have some questions. There's also some other questions on the chat. Um, but maybe we'll go to Vesna first. Are you online and can you share? We also have a different and very interesting angle. There we go. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Vesna Manojlovic. I uh, you are you, your uh, voice level is pretty low. If you can adjust, otherwise we'll tune up uh, our volume. I'll try speaking louder. That's much better. Thank you. I'm Vesna. I uh, work as a community builder for Ripe NCC. Uh, however, today I'm uh, speaking uh, as an activist and uh, as an intersectional feminist and as a parent of activists. So I uh, submitted a paper that uh, have been uh, seen very as very political. So I've been asked to talk more about the uh, societal aspects of where does the environmental sustainability fit, um, not only from the technical perspective. And uh, so I wish to propose that we don't limit ourselves to only talking about environmental sustainability, but uh, work towards climate justice. So I'd like to, uh, on this one slide, propose like three problems and three possible uh, solutions in a broadest possible sense. Um, one of the structural problems of our society and politics and economics, rather than just technical, is the inequality of the environmental impact. We, something that we used to call digital divide, um, referring to the lack of access to the digital technologies in the so-called global south. Uh, but uh, now we can actually also call a digital colonialism in which we are um, kind of repeating the history of the uh, actual uh, economic colonialism in the digital sphere where we uh, copy the exploitations, economic exploitation and nature exploitation uh, that are predominantly uh, kind of externalized towards the global south and cause most harms to the communities that are actually removed from all these decision making processes and from the benefits that digitalization brings to the people in the global north. And uh, another part of that is um, the policies of extractivism. So just taking as much energy resources, uh, raw materials, water, in order to produce these digital devices, and then later kind of throwing them away. And uh, uh, again, predominantly in the global south or the, in an in unequal way. The way how to deal with that would be uh, to consider ourselves 
uh, as one humanity and uh, to show solidarity with uh, uh, the parts of the world and the communities that have been already impacted disproportionately with these developments and to at least minimize the harms and with the goal of stopping the harms to those um, communities and, uh, and uh, those natural environments. The second problem is uh, our belief in uh, endless growth on a, um, a limited planet, which as engineers and scientists, we should uh, understand that it is just impossible. And so uh, that is um, seen in uh, consumerism or chasing the luxury goods or in the more like technical optimism way as going for innovation, trying to make things to be faster um, and uh, larger and reaching more and more of the um, consumers, let's say, and also in the short term thinking and uh, aiming for convenience. And so to, um, to combat that, we need to change the way of thinking and to implement the, the thinking of sufficiency or even modesty and frugality in our technical design, uh, considering limited extractivism, decreasing the growth and focusing on the common resources and common goods, or in a more like down to earth tech on the free and open source software and uh, open hardware and open standards that the IETF is famous for. And finally, uh, addiction to fossil fuels and all the other overconsumed materials like water and land and uh, minerals, we have to just stop doing that. So our previous speakers already talked about the greening the energy sources, but we also have to decrease the use of energy, even if it is renewable energy, because it is needed for the more um, uh, life affirming needs of the people rather than for the data centers. And so in the tech field, we should be focusing on repairability, circular economy and durable tech. My next slide is uh, just uh, uh, translating these suggestions for the uh, follow up sessions on these workshops. So in the second session, uh, there were a lot of topics covered about the energy. Uh, but I would like to suggest also considering the water and minerals uh, consumption and uh, focus less on the measurements and more on the actual activities. Second, when we consider the improvements, I'm suggesting that we uh, consider something opposite from what we were doing until now, and that is not growing, but decreasing, because the climate goals are also saying that we have to decrease year on year uh, according to the certain percentage, so we could put that in all of our design plans and be very ambitious and say we want to decrease everything by, let's say, 10% per year. Uh, and the other um, advice would be to consider that the future is going to contain uh, more protests, more wars, more refugees, more hurricanes and other natural, nat natural disasters that we should adjust the tech to those emergency situations rather than to the uh, luxury usages that we have been uh, accustomed to. And uh, to be aware of the efficiency paradoxes and the power structures and the power differentials to consider who is not in the room and how can we consider their needs. And uh, finally, as the next steps, please let's not limit ourselves to just us who are in the room, but consider working together with both the end users. Uh, there is already an RFC about that, uh, how the internet is for the end users. Uh, the um, research groups like uh, Gaia and activists, and also the uh, existing climate justice organizations. And uh, there won't be any internet on the burning planet, so that's why I'm uh, speaking here as an activist. Thank you. Thanks much. That was also super interesting and a worthwhile angle to, to discuss. Um, so now we have uh, about 15 minutes for discussion. If you want on the queue, um, 
just uh, put plus Q in the in the chat, and actually I did that uh, as an example, and also because I wanted to ask a question, so I'll, I'll shoot my question first. Um, Eve, um, just inspired by your presentation, which was very interesting. Um, so, so you talk about this uh, carbon awareness, and is that what the um, the approach to that would that be mostly intra-domain or inter-domain? Because I presume that the challenges between those two would be very different. Like you can in inter-domain, you can trust mostly <laughs> what the devices say, but inter-domain that might be much more difficult. So right. What, think... where, where is the focus mostly? Right. I, I don't know where, where it will be, but I mean, you've uh, targeted uh, something that we've been thinking about, which is um, within an administrative domain, you might have the granularity of detail about what not only the devices along a path, all those network elements along the path might be consuming um, and where they reside and all of that interesting, rich information. Um, but once you leave the bound that boundary or that scope, you are at the mercy of um, you know other elements, and and not only that, but there's so many elements that are hidden from view in our network paths that also consume energy that have these secondary effects. Um, so is it sufficient to just measure the the consumption of energy along a route? There's like this whole supporting cast that we don't quite know how to um, uh, comprehend just yet. And so we are going to have to partner with other AESs that we transit. Um, and uh, so I, we don't have a solution as yet. I mean, I think that's where the research is. What should be exposed? Should it be, at a, where should it be exposed? Should it be exposed at the boundaries so that for hop by hop technology, we can kind of accumulate ranges of expectation around um, energy usage and carbon intensities and things like that. So it's a big unknown. And so we welcome people's um, thoughts, either off the cuff or if they have experience in things that are similar to this, for example. Thank you. Looks like the researchers will have some work, work to do. Uh, on the queue, there's Lars. Hello. Um, so this was really interesting uh, and, and uh, quite diverse. So I, I actually sort of Felt that Vesna sort of summarized a bunch of points that that I've sort of been been bouncing around in my head, right? Because, you know, obviously we can try and build an internet that uses like half the power, right? We rip all the equipment out and we put new equipment, in and then, um, you know, then we were great. We were, you know, only using half the power, but but in terms of waste and CO two balance, we probably done pretty poorly because we, you know, just doubled the embodied uh, carbon of the internet, and. So I think we got to get to the point that that Vesna was lining out and, and she did it in a very activist way, but I, I really feel sympathetic to the concept. We need to sort of not look at the internet and its capacity is unlimited, right? We've always sort of been banking on the internet getting better over time. And, and it does that by using more and more resources. And I think we got to sort of slow that down or ideally reverse it. And that means we need to sort of figure out what is worth sending when and what is worth putting on the internet and what isn't. And this isn't unfortunately just us in the IETF, right? It's it, we don't get generate the data. The data gets generated by various services and platforms and what have you. Um, but I think this sort of notion that you know um, we got to be more frugal with with the capacity um, might lead us down a path that sort of hopefully gets us to a, a burning planet slower. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Yuka, and then after you, uh, it will be Suresh and Pernilla. We're not hearing you. Sorry, user error. Uh, one thing that I always wonder is that, I don't know how to put this, but what happens if all energy is from your renewable sources? Is that the end of the work? And because it seems to be that, you know, a lot of work is done on uh, kind of claiming that if we are using renewable energy, then all is fine. But for example, I was talking to one major cloud service provider a few a few months ago, and it was interesting that you know they plan on having everything based on renewable energy by 2030. But then I asked that what is their absolute energy consumption going to look like? And the answer was that it grows by 25% per year. 
we are talking about give or take 500 percent of more renewable energy needed to be built for this one single player so renewable doesn't mean carbon free and that's the point that you know the, in my opinion the answer that we use renewable energy we're solving the problem then that's the kind of the short-term solution for the next few years and after that you know what's the next solution so kind of I was pretty much in line with what Vesna was, Vesna was saying, and there's many, many topics I agree in the big picture related to this whole ICT and consumption and so forth. But maybe I'll stop here, otherwise I'm going to give a lecture, and that's not the point today. Right, thank you. And then Suresh. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Eve. Like, uh, so that was a really fascinating presentation. So one question I had is, like, you're talking about hop by hop stuff. Um, it, do you know of anything that like you know how these like hops are apportioned their share of like uh, carbon emissions like is, is there something um we can actually do there right because it seems like a very difficult problem like we never managed to do this like in a um, multi-domain basis or multi-administrative domain basis so is there any thoughts like how you would go about it yep. i I was drawing analogies to um, sort of what happens in the measurement community as you transit paths and you collect information, measurement information. Um, and so, you know, I don't know whether that those might be the same kinds of technologies that we, we would use or protocols that do that. But you're right. Um, we haven't traditionally looked beyond specific kinds of attributes about our network performance, like packet loss. Um, and latency and the variance in the latency, otherwise known as jitter. Um, and it begs the question, can we even rely on external uh, measurement from other places to tell us about the energy consumed or the carbon intensity, which are things that might fall outside um, uh, the ownership uh, of those who are operating the networks. Um, and so we need to have some kind of trust relationship there. I don't. I can't say that, I, um, you know, which technologies have really scaled in order to do hop by hop accumulation. I know that there have been, and, and Carlos, please pipe up. I know that you did this canvassing. I sort of view RSVP as one of these protocols that that did some of that. There, there are other things out there. I was thinking more in the small scale, uh, looking to the debt network, uh, but there's lots of um, things coming out of the T's working group. Um, and elsewhere in the measurement side of the ITF that might be places to glean for insights there. Um, whether it's worked or not at scale, um, I need to probably defer to those more on the measurement side. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Eve. Thanks, Pernilla. Hi all, sorry I couldn't join you from start. I'm Panila, I'm a colleague of Ejari and I uh, work as a principal researcher for ICT sustainability impact and I'm also uh, co-chairing the standardization work in ITU on the development of assessment standards. Uh, so I just wanted to, to, to first I've, <laughs> I'm very glad to be here. It seems like a very uh, interesting event, uh, but I also wanted to, to both comment on what Jukka said and also to refer a bit to the work that we have done in ITU because that could be be of interest here. So I agree with when we so in in the frame of ITU we have developed a trajectory which is a normative uh, uh, and feasible trajectory for the ICT sector and when we talk about the ICT sector we talk about uh, data center networks and user devices taken from a life cycle perspective and it says that the sector should uh, reduce its emission by um, the footprint emissions by 45% from 2020 to 2030. And this has also been uh, adopted by the science-based target initiative. It was developed jointly by science-based target initiative, uh, ITU, GSMA, JESSE, and we had also participation from the IEA. Um, so uh, what, what we have seen in this uh, trajectory is that about 80% of the overall life cycle footprint uh, relates to the use of electricity. And so of course, uh, switching to renewable is uh, 
paramount. It's uh, very important, but it's not sufficient. Um, first, it's not the full footprint. It's not the full uh, perspective of environmental impacts. And it's also, uh, as uh, Juka mentioned, uh, it's, it, we, st we, we still need to produce the energy even if we come from, from renewable sources and there we, this will be, a, of course, a, um, a constraint in the availability. So there are many reasons to, to, to think broader. Uh, but but this this uh, trajectory we have developed to, uh, together with a uh, net zero standard, uh, which is aligned with uh, such as the uh, um, uh, the race to zero and the science based target initiative net zero standard. Uh, but from the assessment perspective, we have in particular developed an LCA standard for for products, networks, and services. There is a uh, standard for calculating the uh, footprint of the entire sector and what should be taken into account and so on. Uh, and this is important because we see that many studies are quite uh, simplistic, let's say, and they make uh, assumptions on energy models which are uh, uh, just scale with data, though we know that the majority of energy is there to keep the systems up and running and so on. Uh, and then we have also, uh, exactly today actually, uh, pub, uh, ax, uh, agreed uh, or approved even a standard which is dealing with the indirect or how to to uh, quantify the indirect or effects of ICT. So I just thought those were some some things that could be useful to know about. Thank you. Uh, thanks and um, at least on my scan I don't see other people were uh, about to run out of time. Um, so if people have quick comments, we can take them now. Otherwise, we could finish and then return to the topics uh, on Thursday. I did want to say that um, that uh, like this, yeah, this discussion that we just had about uh, renewable energy versus uh, reducing the energy consumption and so on. I think that's uh, yeah, probably a trap that we should not fall into too much. It's not a question of you know whose solution can solve this whole problem. If we had a solution like that, you know, it'd be much better. We don't actually. We actually have to use all of these tools that we have have been discussing to lesser or greater extent, and that together maybe helps us a little bit, or hopefully gets our part of the system at least out of the critical path. But um, but it's not just one tool. It's uh, yeah, clean energy and reductions and better implementations, better standards taking into account the societal issues and justice and everything else. So that, that's my conclusion at least. Any other last words or, or uh, comments? Or... I just wanted to point out that people don't need to wait until Thursday, right? There's a mailing list and we can continue the discussion in the chat now on, on that list. So you don't get bored over the next few days when nothing's happening in terms of sessions. Yeah, indeed. Thank you, Lars. And uh, part of the reason why we have separate sessions on separate days is that we can have time between the sessions to think about stuff and, you know, reflect and maybe send email and also prepare for the next next discussions. Okay, then. Uh, thank you. This has been a very interesting session with many different angles and, and good discussion. So there's uh, clearly work to be done in terms of uh, having right measurement data. Um, we had some discussion of that on the chat as well and and uh, and then the actual improvements. So let's get to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye now. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.